Hello, beautiful souls. You're listening to the Angels and Awakening podcast. I'm your host and author, Julie Jancis. Did you know that you can listen to this show everywhere podcasts are found? It's true. Now, I have three free gifts just for you. First gift, I give away a new reading each week to a person who's left a five-star positive review of this show, then submitted it to me using the contact form at theangelmedium.com backslash contact. I hope I'm calling your number next. Second gift, if you'd like a new daily angel message, join me on Insta at Angel Podcast. Third free gift, if you'd like to know the name of one of your guardian angels so that you can work with them even more closely, go to the homepage of my website, theangelmedium.com, and submit your contact info at the very top. I'll email you back personally with the name of one of your angels. Okay, as we begin the show, I want you to feel the presence of your angels surrounding you. And just know that the loving, positive messages you resonate with today are messages for you from your angels and loved ones on the other side. Oh, and don't forget to register for the spiritual retreat because the early bird pricing is ending June 30th. We don't want you to miss it. Sign up over at theangelmedium.com backslash retreat. That's theangelmedium.com backslash retreat. Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back to the Angels and Awakening podcast. I'm your host and author, Julie Jancis. And friends, we have on a special guest today. We have on Dr. Emma Seppala. She um, teaches executives at Yale School of Management and is the faculty director of the Yale School of Management's Women's Leadership Program. That sounds wonderful. (laughs) She's a psychologist and research scientist by training. Her expertise is in the science of happiness. Hello, this is going to be amazing. (laughs) Emotional intelligence and social connection. Her best-selling book, The Happiness Track, um, was translated into dozens of languages. And now you have this new book, Sovereign. I'm so excited to have you here, Emma. I not, I don't normally read introductions, but you are so accomplished. And I just like, wow, I read through that. And I thought the audience needs to know these things. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julie. It's a pleasure to be here. Yay. So let's start out here because um, I'm always fascinated by people's journeys and how mm-hmm. spirit kind of walks them to their path. How did you become interested in this topic to begin with? Well, thanks for asking. I grew up in Paris, France, which sounds so glamorous on the outside, but the philosophy on the streets is one of sort of criticism and complaint and uh, focus on the negative. And so growing up there, you just kind of feel like everything's always going to hell in the handbasket. And um, there's a sense of doom and gloom about life. And I moved to the U.S. for college at 17. And I realized, wow, in the U.S., they don't have patience for complaints and they are much more positive. And I thought, I like this better. Um, But after a couple of years here, I also just saw that Americans run themselves into the ground and they believe that they are what they do. And there's so much burnout. And that seemed to be um, something that was really keeping people from really being fulfilled. And after that, I went to, after college, I went to China for a couple of years. And in China, I saw people who had absolutely nothing and were grateful for absolutely everything. And I saw the same thing in India. And I realized, wow, you know, our well being has to do with the state of our mind, not with the quality of our life. You know, you can be sovereign, you can be happy, fulfilled, grateful, even in situations that are hard. And you can be super unhappy and ungrateful, even when you have everything at your disposal. Like, men, you know, many people have in the U.S., many people in the U.S. have more than, you know, what 95% of the world has. And even if they are have an average income. And, um, and so that really got me interested in this topic of how do you, how do you cultivate a state of mind like that? How do you, what is it about these people who have this? And I did a master's in East Asian studies at Columbia. And actually I focused in on Indo-Tibetan um, philosophies and religions and 
got really interested in meditation and I was considering actually doing a PhD in religion, but then I realized that a lot of the scholars, all they do is sort of debate about translations and they're all stuck in their head about things. And I thought, no, you know, if I, if I have a spiritual practice in my life, it's going to be personal. Um, and I'm not going to study it intellectually, but is there a way to study, to research um, some of these methods that come from these traditions to see whether they can help people? And that's where I ended up in psychology. And I did a lot of research on different meditation practices, breathing practices for anxiety, for trauma, mental health, well-being, social connection. Got really interested in that and um, and the field of compassion. And so I've, I've been working with veterans with trauma, with students, um, who are anxious um, with people who feel disconnected, different things like that. And uh, and then I started writing because I was like, God, there's so much cool research and people don't know about it. Let's write about this. So that's how I wrote my first book, The Happiness Track, which I was trying to trying to share with people. You know, you don't have to run yourself into the ground to be happy. In fact, you're not going to be happy that way, but you're going to be much more successful even in your work life if you take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing. And then in my newest book, I go a little bit even beyond the science of happiness in, in my new book, Sovereign, I, I look at what, you know, you could be doing all the happiness and well-being practices that are out there that everybody knows about now, but still not be in a place of having a fulfilled life. And that is because we often fall for ways of thinking, being, acting, compulsive behaviors, addictive behaviors that are actually preventing us from living the life we want. And I wanted to spell that out, show the science behind it and help people sort of wake up to those things. Interesting. Okay. So my ADHD mind can't jump off of this. I know it's uh -huh. not on topic, which I normally don't do, but um, you mentioned a degree you thought about in religion or theology and then decided against it. I was looking at something the other day because my daughter's going to be looking at colleges in four years. So I'm already starting to look at different things. And um, that is the one degree where they have the least unemployment rate religion and theology, which I think is so oh. fascinating and probably listeners why a lot of people come through the angel Reiki school because um, it just provides so much, but let's focus in on here because you touched on so much good stuff. Um, I also just read recently and I can't remember where I read this, but that people have this concept of like, what do I want? What do I want? And you're in the present moment as you're thinking on behalf of your future self, what do I want? And so you get into that future you and they say nine times out of 10, you achieve what it is that you will want to achieve. You, you get to that place, but now you're in a different present moment in the future and future you want something different than what past you wanted. So they said so many people have this feeling of like, I'm never achieving what I want. I'm never reaching my goals. But they said, you really are. You're just in a different present moment wanting something else, but you've achieved everything past you wanted. And I was like, mind blown. That is just an amazing concept. Absolutely. You know, and we can be on the hamster wheel of I want, I want for the rest of our lives and never be happy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's that, you know, that desire that's constantly running our mind and it can take you away from the joy of like right here, right now. And I think that's what practices like meditation and breathing practices, they can take you back into the present moment and just open your eyes and be like, oh my gosh, like even right now, like, wow, it's spring outside. The birds only sing in the morning for a short period of time for a few windows mm -hmm. of weeks in the year. The same thing with the, um, you know, the, the flowering trees in the spring is like, this is it. It's it. And it, it lasts a couple of weeks. It's like, are we like, are we awake to the world around us? Yeah. You know, if we're constantly in that desire space, not that we shouldn't have goals and ambitions, but don't let it take away from right here, right now, because, you know, we don't, we just don't know how long we have. And I know that can sound cliche sometimes, but the truth is if you look around and things are just, you know, you just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Set us up here. How do you define happiness and not to like add any answer in here for you, but do you think that we have the wrong concept of what happiness really is and that we should all be changing our vocabulary to the word fulfillment? 
I mean, I, I, I like to use that word. Um, so scientists think of happiness in two ways. One is eudaimonic happiness and one is uh, hedonic happiness. So hedonic happiness is sort of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll pleasure, you know, food, um, money, power, fame, clicks, likes on social media. I mean, all the big checks, you know, big money wins, whatever it is, popularity. Those are the things that give you a little high. And it's very like me, myself, and I high. And it gives you a little dopamine kick. Um, but then it comes crashing down and leaves you wanting more, which is why people who win the lottery, they're not happy for that long. After, you know what I mean? It's just, it's a very short-lived high. And yet the, the eudaimonic happiness is the happiness that comes from living a life of compassion, something beyond yourself. It could be compassion. It could be um, caring about something beyond yourself, you know, wanting to work towards the betterment of the planet or animals or whatever it is. But it could also be connection to nature, connection to something bigger than you, connection to a spiritual uh, practice or, or a spiritual guide or divinity or whatever it is that resonates for that person. It's something beyond me, myself and I, and you're connecting outward. Maybe you're making a difference in some way. And that kind of happiness research shows is the kind of happiness that is long lasting. That's why we call it fulfillment. It's not like a short little high that then let, leaves you high and dry, right? It's just, it's, it, it continues. And that's why when I summarize like that, the science of, of happiness, I could summarize it in one sentence from what I know of the research, which is several decades of research now, is that the happiest people are the people who live a life characterized by compassion, balanced with self-compassion. And that last piece is really important, especially I think for women, but, but for everyone, you know, we're really taught to be self-critical people tend, you know, are very hard on themselves and it doesn't make any factual sense. Like it doesn't make any sense to have a, you know, we talk about toxic relationships with workplace or partners or whatever. Most people are running around with a toxic relationship with themselves. And that's one of the things I talk about in sovereign is just like, let's wake up to some of the things we're doing and not questioning, you know, um, and so, you know, that, that self-compassion piece is really key as well. So um, tell me that again. So the dopamine piece is called what within, and that service connection happiness yeah. is called what? So there's hedonic, like, like hedonism, you know, yeah. H-E-D-O-N-I-C, and then eudaimonic, which is spelled E-U-D-A-I-M-O-N-I-C, eudaimonic. Amazing. Okay. So that's really interesting. My question is, when people find more of that eudaimonic fulfillment, do they not need as much dopamine hit? Right. I mean, and it's so interesting to me, right? Because I have recently had the good fortune of meeting a bunch of teenagers who have been meditating for many years and who love to do community service. And I was talking to one of them the other day and I was like, so do you feel different from your friends? And he's like, yeah, he's like. I kind of, you know, they want a big car, big house, this. I'm like, I kind of see through all that. Like, I'm just not into it. And it's just so interesting, you know, because here, he, you know, once you have a taste of something bigger, you know, then like making this really concrete, all of us have had the experience of maybe having not a great day, but then being all of a sudden an emergency happens to a friend or family member and we show up, we help them, we're hundred percent on with them. And then how do we feel? Like, how do you feel when that happens? Amazing. You feel amazing, right? So we all have had that experience and we know that the greatest source of happiness is indeed being able to show up for someone else. And I know, Julie, this is what you do with your work, your life's work. And when we do that, we feel it uplifts us, like helping others helps us, right? And and yet we live in, a, and once you have that, everything else kind of, it doesn't look as appetizing. You're like, yeah, like that chocolate cake would be nice, but whatever, it's, I know it's not going to last, you know, like whatever it's, it's fun, but it's not the answer, nor is having a ton of money is not the answer, you, but society as a whole and marketing agents all over the world are going to try and persuade us that whatever it is, like look like this, eat this, achieve this. You're going to be, you know, happy. But once you've had a taste of the eudaimonic forms of happiness, you know, like, yeah, those things might give a little high, but they're not going to lead to that fulfillment that I'm actually looking for. And a lot of people don't know that, but if they really, because one of the reasons is our society doesn't teach us that because nobody's making money off of you going out and, you know, doing more meditation, spending more time in nature and helping other people. Like nobody's marketing that to you, but the research shows that's what's going to make you happiest.
Ready for a little getaway that completely resets your energy? We're hosting a live in-person spiritual retreat called A Whole New You. It's the weekend of October 4th in Oak Brook, Illinois. This spiritual retreat is all about your own personal healing and growth, reconnecting with yourself, learning to connect with your angels. And I'm going to talk about all new angels that I've never talked about anywhere before. And you're going to leave with more personal peace, purpose, clarity, and confidence than ever before. Learn more and see the itinerary at theangelmedium.com backslash retreat. That's theangelmedium.com backslash retreat. Links are in the show notes. And friend, I cannot wait to meet you and hug you in person. Yeah, totally. So I am, and I totally get where you're coming from. Um, And to each their own, you know, everybody's got their own different path and I don't want to shame anybody, but at the same time, it's just heart wrenching and crushing to just see influencers on TikTok here and there monetizing things in a way where it's to get to those dopamine hedonic rewards that materialism and you're like what is happening within our world why can't people see that like like why why can't i don't understand well it's hard to when you're a fish in water you don't know you're in water and you know if teenagers are growing up and adults are growing up and these with these messaging constantly conditioning your mind. And again, that's why I call my book sovereign. Cause I was like, wait, when we wake up to things that we are sovereign and you can be in that world, but not of it. So I'm going to share with you a really interesting story. I was actually interviewing a Colonel in the military whose job it is to was in communications, which means his job was to condition the minds of the enemy with specifically written messaging, right. That was transmitted through, you know, local people. So basically brainwashing, right? Mm -hmm. So that's his job. So then I said, so how do you go about like interacting with your world when you're back in the US? He's like, well, everything I read, I I look for the reader's writer's intent. You know, it's kind of like what we did in in English class in eighth grade, right? What was the writer's intent? But doing that always. And I was like, well, how do you do that with your kids? He's like, well, we go to the supermarket and my kid will be like, oh, I want that like you know, unhealthy sugary cereal or whatever. And then he'll be like, oh, really? Why do you want that? Oh, look, it's so pretty. It's like red and like cute. And like, it, why do you think it's like that? Oh, because it makes you happy when you look at it. It's so fun. you like, you just want to like, look through the games on the back. And it's like, so fun. Oh yeah, it looks really fun. Like, why do you think they made it that way? Oh, they make his like, kids will love it. And he's like, yeah. Like he's like training his own child to become, to discern, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I think that once you wake up to that, you can't really not see it anymore. Then then you're awake, you know, and that, that was the whole point of my book. It's like, let's read this. Let's sort of wake up to things. And then you can uh, fall less prey to the conditioning because it is a very, it has been created by some of the smartest minds of the planet, right? Uh, the undergrads who are at Yale, Harvard, Stanford, they're all being recruited to work for Instagram, work for some of these social media companies that are making sure that it's so addictive to go through it. For example, like I took, and I have to use the social media because that's part of promoting my books and so forth. And I like to ins- use it to inspire people. So I have Instagram, but I don't have it on my phone mm-hmm. and I have it. And when I have to go through my web browser to it, it's not addictive, but on my phone, I realize, oh, wow, it's a very different form of interaction because it has been so specifically designed for you to be hooked, you know? Mm-hmm. So just little techniques you can do it and just not be sucked in. You can consume what you want and not be sort of a victim of the of that. A hundred percent. So in earlier podcast episodes, um, my listeners know that I had a mental break years and years ago in 2015, 2016, and ended up doing like a seven day in person person stay. And then, uh, like a 30 day outpatient stay. And one of the things that they do when you come in patient is your phone gets stripped away from you very first thing. And living seven days without your phone, your complete vibration shifts yeah. of you physically feel different. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. And it's so interesting because when I lived in China, 
and this was back before there were cell phones were so prevalent. But when I lived in China, even all the advertising that was going on around me was not aimed at me. It was aimed at Chinese people like take this, grow taller, like take this, make your skin whiter or whatever. And I was like, wow, for two years, I lived without anyone advertising toward to me. And it was the most wow. incredible experience because I was like, I was wearing whatever the hell I want. I didn't know what like the quote unquote trends were. I had no idea. And no, my mind was not being imprinted by look like this, do this, must see this, watch this movie, da, 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 da. No, I didn't have anything. It was fantastic. And I, but I think we can, you know, without, with our phones, like I took social media off my phone two years ago. And then a year ago, I took email off my phone. And, you know, some people can be like, oh, but that's not possible. Like I need to be, you know, I need to be reachable all the time. Well, that's why you have a phone. Like I know CEOs who don't have email on their phone because it liberates them to have free up their mind to actually yeah. do the work they want to do, to think the innovative thoughts, to create, to, to be more impactful than if they were constantly slaved to their messaging, which so is yeah, yeah. not life or death, you know, unless you're a doctor and you're like in the emergency room, you know, that let's go there because your new book is so powerful. It's called sovereign reclaim your freedom, energy, and power in a time of distraction, uncertainty, and chaos. Like, I don't know of a book that's more needed at this moment for humanity than this. Um, let's start here because I'm a big fan of the crown. And I think that they even use the word sovereign to describe royalty, right? So um, what do you mean by sovereign? Well, it's a lot of what we just talked about, you know, do we want to walk through our life subject to different sort of programming um, that's going on, whether it's through our technology, but also in our own mind. Like I was saying earlier, a lot of people are walking around very self-critical, which from a psychological point perspective is self-loathing. Mm. And we fail to question these things, but the research shows they lead to anxiety, depression, or less, less resilience. And the whole point of this book is to help people reclaim their inborn resilience. We were born to be sovereign. We were born to be resilient, to be ourselves and not to be, um, fall for things like addictive behaviors, fall for things like, um, you know, abusive relationships, or there's, there's so many things that we are often engaged in without realizing that they're destructive to us. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I, I talk about how to have sovereign relationship with yourself, how to have sovereign emotions. Most people, no matter how, how educated they are, um, have no idea what to do with their big, bad, negative emotions, which is when we fall to sort of addictive behaviors. And you might think, oh, well, I don't, I'm not an alcoholic, but most people will do something, whether you're shopping or overworking, it can look saintly. You could be doing community service 40 hours a week. You could be at the gym all the time, like, but it most people have not learned how to handle their emotions. And then the emotions, those emotions are running the show, running their life, the mm -hmm. trauma, things from the past that are still controlling people, you know, that past difficult emo uh, relationships that are still making it difficult for you to enter a new relationship. There are many, many ways in which without realizing it, we could, again, we could be doing all the well-being practices, but if we don't address the way in which our mind gets bound up and free it, and we can't live a fully sovereign life. And the reason why I want everyone to live a fully sovereign life is because everyone has unique gifts to give to this planet. And our planet desperately needs it. Look at it. Look at the mess we're in, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so you're speaking my language. <laughs> so yeah. that's the point. And people who've read the book, and just today I was received a message from someone who's an early reader, and she was saying, just reading it, it's like deprogramming me. And I'm like, yes, that was the goal. <laughs> that's amazing. Um well, on a side note, I'd love to stay connected because my new book that I just wrote is all about using your intuition to get to that place yeah. of fulfillment. Um, but I see this energy that you're describing of the self-loathing all the time in my sessions and spirit comes in all the time to address it. And the energy you can, I personally feel, hear, see energy, but you can feel it a ton as an openness or a closeness, right? So there are times where people are just so self-loathing and in the, I can't, I won't, I, you know, I, other people can, but I can't, that it's shutting them down from right. dreaming, from seeing possibilities, from um, really living this life that I believe our soul came here to live. Yeah. And we're wasting it. Um, there yes. are other people who, you know, we're gearing up here for a new class of the Angel Reiki School. And a lot of people have said, Julie, 
you know, has anybody not been successful? If so, why? And I said, yes, you know, there's been a couple of people and there are a few people who just tell themselves constantly, I can't do this. I can't do this. I'm not good at this. Other people can do it. I can't. We all have that a little bit, but most of us have something where we can kind of work through it. But there are some people who it weighs more heavily on than others. Do you see that too? Yes. And I agree with you that, you know, in a room of 40 people, like 38 people will have that. And I'm, I'm teaching a women's leadership program at Yale right now, all these talented high level executives that come in and there will be most of the people in the room will raise their hand when I ask how self-critical are you self-critical, you know, and then there'll be one or two who are not. And you can tell that they don't because they show up powerful. They're powerful because they're not standing in their own way. They're not buying into the programming that, you know, I feel like everybody has received, but especially women and they're free from it. And you can tell because they're sovereign. And, um, and so it's, you know, what's interesting to me, actually, what I've noticed in my last couple of cohort, cohorts, it's been a, the, the couple of women who've shown up sovereign were black women. Mm. And I often wonder whether it's because they have not only are they women, but they've gone through other, other hardships due to their race that have put them through the ringer and where they're coming out saying enough, like yeah. no, I am showing up as me with all my talents and my beauty and my everything yeah. and watch out world, you know? Yeah. And, but do we, do we don't all need to go through the ringer? We can do this, but we can look at our, the role models around us, the few women who are owning their power completely and realize, yes, I can, I can do this too. And one of the, First steps is this awareness, like being aware of how, what is, what is my relationship with myself? Yeah. Side note to everybody who's like, Julie, I feel fearful of starting the angel Reiki school and, um, you know, developing my gifts. It's not that you, um, are fearful. Like, what if I can, what if I don't have gifts? What if I do? Everybody has that, but there's some people who won't open even a tiny little crack to, maybe I'm gifted. If you come into the program and you're like, God, universe source, I don't know how you're going to open me to my gifts, but I know that you can. That's all you need in order to be successful. Um, I do have a question going back to what you were just saying, Emma. When you see sovereignty in folks, there's a statistic out there that 90% of people pass away with regrets. 76% of people's number one regret is not doing something out of fear of what other people would think. Is there any, because there is ADHD out there. I think your ADHD folks, you find them more in CEO president positions there's a lack of fear in some ways or thinking about what other people think. I think probably because we got shamed so much as children. And so we had to find some sovereignty early on in order to survive, like to hell with what everybody else thinks. I'm just going to go form, forge my own path. Um, is there any research behind left brain versus right brain, ADHD versus neurotypical? when it comes to sovereignty? Hmm. I don't know that I, I know the answer to that. Um, but certainly, you know, one, I have a formula for sovereignty and that's, it starts with awareness. So you have to have awareness what's going on in your mind and in the world with courage and a full tank. So it's awareness plus courage plus a full tank equals sovereignty. So the awareness we've been talking about, the courage is really, like you said, like the hell with it. Like, like even in my book, right. I, I share a lot of personal stuff I've never shared before. You know, some people are like, oh my gosh, you shared. I'm like, yeah, I, I went ahead and did that because, and yeah, I guess it took courage because some of those are really embarrassing stories. But at the same time, I thought, you know what, if I don't show up like this, how can anybody relate? You know, I'm from on high Ivy league, blah, blah, blah. On the one hand, that's where I work. But on the other hand, I, that's, if I come from there, how am I going to be of use? And besides, I'm just a human like everybody else, right? And then the the third aspect is this idea of full tank, which means, you know, you if we're all depleted and running on empty, it's really hard to show up in any which way other than just basic survival, right? 
And, um, yeah. and, you know, many of us are busy and have a lot of things to do and don't have time. And yet there are some things you can do every day, even if you don't have time that help you show up with a fuller tank. What are those things? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I talk about meditation a lot and also for people who are anxious for meditation, for whom meditation is not a, 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 the right first step. And it, that was the case for me because I was in New York during 9-11 and um, what I did was what felt, helped me at the time was a breathing practice called sky breath meditation, which is offered by a nonprofit called art of living. And what I found was that when I was able to learn those breathing practices, I was able to regain sovereignty over my mind and my anxiety. I no longer was slave to that. And, and that's why I ended up doing research with veterans with trauma um, on this breathing practice, the sky breath meditation and seeing how it normalized their anxiety. And they were able to regain sovereignty over their life and move on, no longer have to self-medicate with drugs, alcohol, and all the things they were doing. And so I think um, making time for those kind of practices every day is critical. And again, I like people will be like, well, I don't have time. Well, you know, if everybody's honest with themselves, there's time wasted every day, you know, and it's like in those few pockets that you have for yourself, maybe when everyone's in bed, you know, you've got five, 10 minutes, what are you doing? Are you doom scrolling? Or are you using this moment to do something nutritious for yourself and your mind? So I would say that's one of the things. Um, but other things are trying to get enough rest when you can and trying to get the right kind of foods, you know, um, there's a mental health research that nobody ever talks about, which is the impact of food on mood. And the more fruits and vegetables you eat, the happier you are. Again, nobody talks about this, but research yeah. shows that you go from being as unhappy as someone who's unemployed to someone who's employed if you eat more fruits and vegetables. I mean, we all knew it was good for our heart, but it's good for our mental health. Of course, you know, people who live in food deserts and so forth, that's that's a disadvantage for them to be able to, to purchase those. But um, just some real basic things. But I think the meditation and breathing is really key. Too. Yeah. And being Do outside. Ever, yeah. It's different yeah. things. Getting Do you sunshine. ever work with um, executives who are like optimizing their time the best that they can? But, um, you know, I was just talking to my therapist the other week about I can get into this stuck cycle where I'm going a hundred miles an hour, working on this book, working on TV show, working on a million different things. And, um, it's the pressure that comes from wanting it to be perfect, wanting to show up in the world. Perfect. And my counselor was like, okay, let me give you two different Instagram influencer names and tell me who you resonate more with. And she's like, Mel Robbins or so-and-so. And I won't say the other name. And I go, Mel Robbins. She's like, yeah, why? And I go, because she's real. And, and she goes, okay, and what does that mean to you? Well, she shows up with no makeup. You know, she allows herself to just be living her life going at the pace that she's going, but she's able to show up. And she goes, yes. And what does that mean? She's relieved all pressure off of herself, right? Like she doesn't have to have that pressure of having to have full makeup, full hair, you know, to go on and to record these podcasts like we're doing today. And I'm in no makeup. Um, uh, she's able to go and just do what she needs to do. And that has really, really been a game changer over the last month of like living in that way, where I think I had stepped into my business and started my business that way. But then there's something that entrepreneurs talk about, the more they get into their business and the more success that they have, the more pressure that they feel to have I don't know if perfection is the right word, but I just want everything to be the best for everybody. And I'll just say this too. Instagram is a messed up place. Social media is a messed up place. I get probably two to three to 10 times more. No, I don't know percentages, double, triple, or quadruple the number of views on posts when I am in hair and makeup versus when I'm not. And so 
the more success you have and you start to see some of these numbers, you think, well, then every single time I get on social media, then I have to be in hair and makeup. Otherwise, it's not going to get that many likes. I could be saying the exact same thing in two different posts, but the one where I look better, people watch. And the one that I don't look better, people don't. And so you want to reach more people. So you place this pressure on yourself. But my God, as soon as you release that pressure, it feels like a completely different experience of life again. Absolutely. You know, um, I my the meditation teacher I've been following for 20 years, his name is Gurudev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. He always says, when you're searching for perfection, your mind becomes imperfect, mm -hmm. right? So you can look perfect, but your mind, you're a mess on the inside. But if you do your best and then surrender, like, okay, this is what I can do. Like, I can tell you, I'm a week from my book launch right now. And there are so many things I could be doing, but I'm also teaching full time this week at Yale. I have two little boys who need me. And last night there was so much more I could be doing, but I was like, you know what? the hell with it. I'm tired. Like I don't need, I'm not going to run myself into the ground right now. What I need to do is lie on the grass and watch my kids playing on the trampoline and not doing anything for the rest of the evening. And we have to live in a way that's sustainable and we have to commit to our number one priority, which is, which is ourselves. I can only show up for my kids and my family, which is of course my priority. If I've shown up for myself, right? Yeah. And if I burn myself out, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, sabotage my whole family, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm just doing the best I can, you know, we're just doing the best that we can. And of course we'd all want everything to be perfect and we'd need a team of 50 people to get all that done. Um, but is it worth sacrificing our mind? Is it worth sacrificing our happiness, our family? Again, thinking, what if this was the last week of my life? Would I want to spend it burnt out and not being able to love on the people I want to love on the way I want to love on them? Yeah, a hundred percent. I don't, I don't know if I want to bring this up, but it's just what's with me. So I'm just going to go there. Um, do you ever get those moments where it's hard to just get out of that state because your mind is ruminating on something? I had that happen last night where there's this situation at my daughter's school and I have a million things to do um, between now and Friday, but there's the situation where um, a parent out of nowhere is basically crucifying and trying to get fired a teacher from the school who um, showed a clown picture. Like he literally, the only thing that he did, and as a journalist, I was thinking to myself, there has to be more to this story. Nope, I dug in. There's no more to this story except this. He created a social studies project for the kids to learn about um, social studies through like an online escape room. And he used clowns in them. Clowns aren't against school policy, but a parent got so upset about it that she's trying to get this man fired. Well, if you dig in to it deeper on Google, this woman has a very criminal past and it's awful. And the school district isn't doing anything about it. So long story short, I have been just trying to like write letters to advocate for this person to try and get him into the classroom because he's been out for two months and, oh, it's just heartbreaking. And I was sitting there last night thinking, because it also, my husband's a teacher and it takes away my safety and security thinking like this could happen to anybody. There needs to be somebody advocating for this man who's five years away from retirement and is just one of the most beautiful teachers out there. Um, but I couldn't get out of this, like, what's more I could do? What more could I do? What more could I do? How do you help yourself not to just go overboard because you do have to have compassion, but then sometimes you've done the best that you can do it's hard to turn your mind off at the end. 
Absolutely. So maybe something that can help is this. So research, you know, um, sometimes you're working on a solution, a problem, you don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, you get this aha insight as to what you could do to solve the problem. You've had that, I'm sure. Yeah. What, what kind of activities are you doing when you have those aha moments? Silence, stillness, just like letting the, I like to let spirit come to me and show me what's the next step. Yeah. And exactly. So what research shows and, you know, people who are maybe less spiritual than you will say also add things like when I'm walking the dog or when I'm in the shower, right? Yeah. Yes. What's, what's the commonality between all that? So research uh, neuroscience has found that we have, we are most likely to get our aha insights, those intu intuitions when we are, um, when our brain is in alpha wave mode, which means it's not highly focused and it's not so relaxed. You're about to fall asleep. It's in this in-between space, which you could think of as your, your, your moments of silence, your moments of prayer, your moments of, of connection, meditation. Um, but we, but people currently, uh, commonly go into those states, like I said, walking the dog, or if they're not on their phone, but they're, you know, uh, in the shower or just making dinner or something. And that's when our brain goes into this. You know, you could either think of it as you know, problem solving mode, or you can think of it as receptivity. And that's when we get our aha insights. So whenever you find yourself ruminating, especially in the situation where you're trying to solve a problem and you're trying to help someone, remembering that, oh, right, my, my answers come to me when I'm taking care of myself and putting myself into more of these moments of stillness could be also taking a walk in nature. And just allowing that, allowing for more of that time. And sometimes, you know, to calm your mind down, you actually need to do something physical, like, um, like stepping out into nature or doing breathing exercises or even yoga or anything that can bring you back in the present moment. Um, but knowing that that is when we're working at our best is when we are in that, those modes. Yeah. Um, and that's what I had to do. It was right before bed. So I had to just breathe. And then I had to tell myself, I am safe. My family is safe. Yes. My husband is safe. Yes. I am safe. My family is safe. My husband is safe. Um, until I just fell asleep. No, I love that. So let's go back to sovereignty because your book is just so powerful and it walks people through all different ways of coming back to their own sovereignty. Um, I know that as you write a book, uh, a lot of times authors think, well, I'm going to go in this direction, but then the book has like a life force of its own and it takes you somewhere else. Did that happen to you at all? And what were like the major um, moments and, and parts in which that happened? I actually felt the whole, the whole book came to me. I felt like the book came to me and was like, Hey, you want to write me? <laughs> And, um, and I said, yes. And so it was kind of like a marriage, you know, and I just felt like I wrote, I knew exactly what was going in each chapter and yes, I needed to dig through the, you know, definitely put lots of research in there and that's all my skill. You know, that's what I do, uh, but I knew exactly what was going where. Um, and I really feel like it was, it came through me because I feel like it's what's needed right now. And, um, and like I said, people who have the early readers are like, oh, this is helping me as I'm reading it. It's kind of like recalibrating me um, to a different space of sovereignty. So yeah, I feel like these are the times that we live in. We live in really crazy times and um, we're being invited to become more aware of how we're living, the choices we're making, and that there are there's another way that's more life supportive so that we can show up, like you said, with all our gifts. Yeah, a hundred percent. So you said awareness plus courage plus a full tank really gets us to that place of um, allowing ourselves to just be who we are, not be influenced by the outside world and all this advertising that's coming through to us. Um, that courage piece is really big big for people. And I wonder if you can kind of dive into how we develop that courage. You know, courage, I think is developed by just doing what you're scared of and just closing your eyes and jumping in the deep end. And then once you've done it once, you could do it again, but I'll give you a couple examples. One is a, a sister of a friend of mine had a, a really serious illness. And she was told she should change her diet in order to address that illness. 
And she chose not to so that she would look normal. Mm -hmm. She did not want to not look normal. Okay, so she would rather almost die than, than have the courage to do something that isn't normal. So just to show you just how far we can go with this, okay? Um, I mean, it's really crazy when you think about it. Um, but it does need courage. I mean, uh, for example, for myself, I ran a research study. The research study I ran, uh, I won't go into the details of, of what was it was about, but um, I, I had the idea for it. I spent a couple of years raising money for it. I recruited the research assistants. I recruited the participants. I ran the study over several years. I did all the analyses. I wrote up the paper. And then it got blocked by people in my labs. There was politics and they weren't allowing me to move forward with with getting it published. And then another faculty member came along and he needed tenure. So in order to get tenure, you have to have more publications. So he came up to me and said, hey, why don't I help you write this paper? I really just care about the data. It needs to get out there. And I was like, right. I, I knew what he was up to, right? He needed another publication. And, you know, I was like, that's fine. Like I needed help from above. And he was a, had a, he was a professor and I was a research scientist and I needed his help. So I accepted his help. And, and then when I was about to publish it, and it was accepted, he wrote to me and my supervisor and said, hey, how about we be co-first authors? Now, being a first author is a big deal, really. It's like, you're the one who's led this entire project. And I knew that he had not led the entire project. He helped with the last part. So I gave him second authorship ahead of research assistants who had worked really hard for years on this, you know, but I was not, did not think that he deserved co-authorship. And um, he asked me for this, copying my super, a supervisor. So I went to the supervisor and I said, hey, so what do you think of this guy asking me for co-authorship? And he said, I have no problem with it. Mm. Here we are, two se senior people higher on the totem poles, two men. And here I yeah. am, a junior female scientist. Okay. I had, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I could not believe it, how I was completely unsupported. So I took my courage in two hands and I wrote an email to both of them. And I said, I respectfully decline your request. That's it. <laughs> and you know what? It worked. <laughs> but what I'm just saying is, you know, sometimes courage, you just have to do it. And that's it. You do it. And then you just, you practice at it. And I, for many years, I had a hard time even opening my mouth and even saying anything to anybody, let alone having good boundaries. But it took practice. Like I would practice saying something in my head and then I would blurt it out and see what happens. You know, at first you're awkward and you make mistakes and maybe you go a little overboard. So what? You're learning, right? This life is a training ground, isn't it? Yeah, a hundred percent. And what do we, we don't want to be like that person who won't change her diet because she doesn't want to look up abnormal. She'd rather die. I mean, that's crazy. I don't even get like what that would even look like. Like, uh, cause I know what Oprah's talking about now with obesity. And I think that's like a longer conversation, but she didn't want to look thinner or she didn't want to. Yeah. I actually don't know much about, about yeah. that, but yeah. whatever your goals are, why would you prefer death over looking abnormal? A lot of people would. And that's why so many people are afraid of speaking in public because they don't want to rid be ridiculed. They're more scared of that than, a, than a, afraid of death. Yeah. We got to get over that or we're not For living sure. the lives that we want, right? For sure. So what does a happy, like your happiest life from a happiness expert, sovereignty expert, which sovereignty gets us to that place of fulfillment and happiness what does that happiest life look like? I think it's going to vary according to who you are. You know, we all have different goals in life. We all have different ways that we want to live. But I would say that a sovereign life is one where you don't feel bound and restricted by your belief systems, by your emotions, by fear, by anger, um, where you're not beholden to different addictive patterns, where you're not letting others tell you how to think and how to act, but where you are true to yourself, where you're authentic and where you're relaxed because you're living in true respect of yourself, but also you're living in authenticity. And it's a life of freedom. You're feeling free on the inside. You know, we can talk about having freedom on the outside. I want to be free, you know, 
free. I want to work from home, be free in that way. That's great. I want to be financially independent. That's great. But you can have all of the external freedoms. You can have all the external sovereignty, but have no internal sovereignty, right? That's not real sovereignty. This my, my I wrote this book so to help people develop internal sovereignty. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And once you really find that sovereignty, um, and you have your intuition to help you like guide yourself forward, you get to a point in life where you're just untouchable in some ways, like anything could happen. You're going to manage it. You know, any crossroad can come up in life and you're going to figure out the way. Um, I've also heard that uh, in that thing I was referencing earlier, where people think that having challenges come up or crossroads come up or change come up means that it's something bad or you're not really to that place of happiness in your life. But that's not true. The challenges, the obstacles, the crossroads all give you different life force energy in different ways to show you how to thrust yourself forward. Yeah, it's often the difficult parts of our life that have made us wiser, stronger, more compassionate, right? And that's why I also have this whole chapter you're mentioning intuition. I have a whole chapter on the science of intuition. And some people are like, oh my gosh, you're a scientist. And like, you're talking about this. It's like really like daring and like out there and like, well, kind of, but kind of not. I mean, research is showing that when matters are complicated, when you go with your feelings, your gut feeling, you're going to make a better decision. That's like neuroscience research by Joe Michaels, one of my colleagues. And um, the military has been studying intuition for decades. It was made fun of in a movie called Men Who Stare at Goats, but they're still doing research now because so many um, soldiers came back from Afghanistan and Iraq claiming that they, that it was intuition that helped them save their lives or the lives of others, you know? And so the military is always trying to optimize human performance, right? So, and we all have had that experience where we've gone against our intuition. And then later, if we were really honest with ourselves, we always knew this was going to be a bad decision. And, you know, and then others times when we have fallen, like my friend Kushal, who was in one of the Twin Towers during 9-11, and the guards were saying, everyone stay inside. And he ran for it. And he yeah. saved his life by a hair, you know? We so, had him on the show. You had Kushal on the show? Oh, that's yeah. So great. Yeah. Yeah. He's amazing. He's amazing. Yeah. Uh, incredible. So what are the statistics on intuition? Well, like I said, I mean, research shows that we are, you know, when, when decisions are complicated, when decision is simple, you know, you, your phone's broken, you need a new phone. You don't need your intuition for that. But when decisions are really complicated, like, oh, I need, I got this job offer, but it's in another city. I'll have to move my whole family and buy a new house and do this and do that. It is a lot of moving parts, then going with your gut feeling is actually going to help you make a better decision. That's what the research shows. And we, um, you know, we, we often poo poo it because we think, oh, in school and in our society, we're taught to think logically and rationally, which is great. Like we should think logically and rationally, but somehow that's taught us to disregard our gut feelings about things. And yet, um, you know, I really like what Joe Michaels said when he says that, uh, you know, when he's making a complicated decision, he does consult his logic and reason, but he also makes time to consult his gut feeling, including the intuition aspect into, into the way our approach of life, you know, which right now we've mostly excluded it, which hasn't yeah. happened. Yeah. And that's the science that I've seen too. And I don't know if it's Joe's or not, but um, there's so much that Harvard Business Review has like put into when you look at um, the data of what's the practical choice to make and then tune into your intuition, going off of those two things combined lead people to decisions where they don't regret them most of the time. They know that they made the right, right choice at the right time for them. And that was the best that they could do. Exactly. Absolutely. And um, one of my favorite female leaders is Lynn Tilton. She runs the largest women-owned business in America. She's amazing. And uh, she was in on Wall Street in the 80s. 
and she was sexually harassed all the time, but she, she was a single mom in the eighties on wall street. So she was just working for her, for her daughter really. And then, you know, by the time she was 30 or in her thirties, she was like, I'm out of here. Like, you know, get lost, you know, and she moved to Florida with her daughter and was like, I'm going to retire. And then she had a dream, like, like an intuition that came to her as a dream, which was her deceased father. Now her father had um, deceased when she was a teenager. And so she'd experienced firsthand what it's like to have a, a main provider pass away in a family and how devastating that is for a family. And so in this dream that came to her as sort of as an intuition, her father came to her and said, this is not what I had in mind for you, that she just mm -hmm. sort of retire, right? And so she decided to make sure that other families do not have to go through the suffering her family had to go through with the loss of the main provider. So she went and um, purchased companies that had been left for dead, that all the consulting companies had said, forget about it. This company is unsavable. And she bought them and she turned them around and she's called the turnaround queen. And she has saved 700,000 US jobs which is wow. amazing. You know, um, companies that you probably would recognize like Styla Makeup um, that she like turned around and made successful. And she's amazing. And, and she followed her intuition. And when I interviewed her, she also said, you know, you have to follow your intuition. She says, you have to use logic and reason too, but it's the intuition that fuels you and tells you where to go. And then you, you got to use the, intu you know, the, the, the logic and the reasoning to make it happen. But yeah, um, yeah she's, she talks about how that's also being true to yourself. Oh, amazing. This world would be a better place and completely different experience for all. If all were sovereign and listening to their intuition, it would just change everything. Well, that's, that's the hope. So I hope a lot of people read this book and, you know, it's, it's really meant, it's meant sort of as it's a, 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 an invitation. It's an invitation for people to open their eyes and make some choices that are more life supportive for them and therefore for the planet. Because I like that word. Yeah, because when people can show up and are life supportive in their in their life, they're going to be benefiting everybody around them and also yeah. modeling that for others. I like that word invitation. It's the first chapter of your book and it's beautiful. Uh, your book, Sovereign, Reclaim Your Freedom, Energy, and Power in a Time of Distraction, Uncertainty, and Chaos. Emma Seppala, thank you so much for being here. Tell everybody um, where they can find you, the book, and we'll put all of those links in the show notes. Thanks so much. So my book is available on Amazon or anywhere books are sold. Um, and um on Instagram, I'm at the happiness track and I'm also on Facebook and YouTube and X. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all of the work that you're putting into the world. Thank you, Julie, for what you're doing too. Friends, I need your help reaching as many people as possible. If you'd like to support this podcast and help us spread more hope to the world, please book a session with me. Join my angel membership or take my angel Reiki school. What's the difference? If you'd like to know what messages your angels and loved ones have for you, you'll want to book a session with me. The angel membership is all about your own personal spiritual healing. The membership takes you on a spiritual journey that teaches you how to create your own heaven on earth. And the angel Reiki school is for those who want to get certified in mediumship angel messages, and energy healing all at once. These are three ways you can help us share a message of hope and love with more people than ever before. Register for one or all three at theangelmedium.com. That's theangelmedium.com. Now let's pray together. As we do, I want you to pray in a way where you feel as though everything you want for yourself and the world has already come true and you're giving thanks. Why? Because this is the best way to manifest. So let's begin. God, universe, source, thank you. We're so grateful that you've blessed this world with calm and peace for all. This calm and peace has spread like ripples, soothing the hearts of every soul. Thank you for opening our hearts to abundance, allowing each of us to live our most authentic life and helping us to create our own heaven on earth. 
We thank you for the love and deep heart-to-heart connection that surrounds us every day in our relationships. We thank you for the abundance of health and aliveness we feel radiating from every cell in our and our family's bodies. Thank you for the gift of walking this life with us and guiding us every step of the way through your messages. We hear you through our own intuition and we feel you walking right by our sides and we overflow with gratitude. Thank you for financial abundance and abundance of opportunities and miracles, blessings and prosperity in every way. We know that you want us to succeed so that we can show others how you want them to succeed too. Thank you for the boundless love, kindness, empathy, and compassion that binds us all together. Thank you for the laughter, fun, moments of pure delight that fill us every day, especially today. God, Universe Source, thank you for blessing us beyond measure and allowing us to use our souls, gifts, talents, skills, and abilities to serve the world. We love you. I love you. And in this we pray. Amen. Friends, we're working on some pretty major things over here. And if you wouldn't mind saying a little prayer that these things come to fruition, if they're God's will, we'd so appreciate it. And please add a little prayer in for any specific thing you need right now too. Have a beautiful, blessed day. And don't forget to submit your contact info at theangelmedium.com if you'd like me to channel the name of one of your angels for you. Sending you peace, bliss, and many blessings.